Good morning. I am Alain Gupta, a partner with Microsoft Consulting or MSc. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to this exciting webinar. Salam walekum and shubho sakal to all my friends and partners in Bangladesh. Shin chao to all our friends and partners in Vietnam. I and MSc are grateful to all of them for allowing us to work with them as part of our unique innovate, implement, and impact our IT program in Bangladesh and Vietnam. Before I move forward, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of the MetLife Foundation for funding our work with partners in Bangladesh and Vietnam under I3 program. Through their generous support, we are able to help our partners support millions of people, especially women, to access formal financial services and build a better life. Many thanks to the Center for Financial Inclusion to convene Financial Inclusion Week and inviting us to exchange ideas and perspectives from the markets that we work in. As part of today's panel, I have two esteemed guests wherein we will talk about our experiences in two of the markets, Bangladesh and Vietnam. Without further ado, let me introduce the panelists. First panelist is Ms. Kumara Islam. She is founder and executive director of Shakti Foundation in Bangladesh. Shakti Foundation is a non-government organization committed to the economic and social empowerment of disadvantaged women across Bangladesh. MSc supported Shakti on digitizing microfinance, savings, and credit product development and credit scoring tools development. These have helped improve the low-income customers' financial health. Accordingly, Shakti Foundation has reached over 400,000 women customers in last three years. At MSc, we are proud to be associated with Shakti in their journey to help millions of Bangladeshi women live better. Welcome, Kumaira. Thank you. Uh, the second panelist is Mr. Atila Vagada. He is CEO of Care Plus from Vietnam. Care Plus is an associate of Singapore Medical Group a specialty and primary healthcare provider with a network of over 20 medical specialties and 26 clinics across Singapore. Care Plus offers extensive examination and diagnostic uh, capabilities with affordable outpatient healthcare services in Vietnam. MSc is working with Care Plus to develop a mobile telemedicine application to enable a complete digital journey for its customers from online booking, in-app service purchase, digital payments, credit insurance options, and online offline medical consultation services. We are sure that all these initiatives will help low and moderate income or LMI, or LMI segments to avail health services conveniently with lower opportunity cost. Welcome, Athena. Yeah. Before we move forward, let me uh, let us look at a quick three minute video. And in that video, we will hear two stories, one from Bangladesh and one from Vietnam. So I'm requesting my colleague Mitali to run that video, please. <laughs> আমার নাম নাজমিন আমার বাসা দক্ষিণবার কালীগঞ্জ উপজেলা থানা আমি গত 3 বছর ধরে বিকাশ ব্যবহার করতেছি তো বিকাশ থেকে আমি ভালো সুবিধা পাই যেমন আমার হাজবেন্ড ছোটে চাকরি করে মাস শেষে বাড়িতে আসে তো দেখা গেল মাসের যে টাকা আমারে দেয় সময় দেখা যায় 15 দিনে শেষ হয়ে যায় তো টাকাটা তারপর প্রয়োজন পড়ে ও তো কাজ ফিরে আমার কাছে আসতে পারবে না তো আমার বিকাশ থাকা অবস্থায় ও আমার দেখা গেল যে বাসা যে টাকা লাগে 10000 টাকা লাগে 2000 টাকা লাগে বিকাশ আমারে দিয়ে দেয় আমি সুবিধাটা ভালো পাই বিকার যদি ব্যাংকের মতো যে ব্যাংকের মধ্যে আমার টাকাটা রাখলে যে ইন্টারেস্টটা দেয় যা পারি আমি সঞ্চয় হিসাবে রাখতে পারি আর ওই টাকার ইন্টারেস্ট যদি আমারে দেয় তাহলে খুবই ভালো 
বিকাশ আমার জন্য অনেক সুবিধা করছে সকল ক্ষেত্রে আমি অনেক সুবিধা পাই মোবাইল রিচার্জের ক্ষেত্রে পাই কাউকে টাকা পাঠানোর ক্ষেত্রে পাই বা নিজেও সহজে টাকাটা পেয়ে যাই বিকাশ অনেক নিরাপদ তবে জান চোক দই কাক উং জুং থাইন তোয়ান ডিয়েন তু চুয়া ডুক চুয়েন তাই নিউ ডেন কু ভুক ওয়াই থাইন নিউ ইয়া তোই চি তোই কুং নিউ মোই নুই ও দই কুং চি বিয়েট ডেন থাইন তোয়ান চুয়েন থং হই নাপ টিয়েন ডিয়েন থাই না লা তন কুয়া হাং টিয়েন নই মুয়া থে ডং টিয়েন ডিয়েন নুক থি ফাই লা বিউ ডিয়েন পা থাইন তোয়ান হোয়ান তোয়ান বাং টিয়েন মাত কো নিউ কাই বট টিয়েন নাম মুয়া জো লা মিং কুং ফাই ডি মা নিউ কি কোন কুইন হাট থাইন তোয়ান না কোন বি কাট ডিয়েন কাট নুক চং ডট জিক ভুয়া কোয়া থি তোই ডুক কোন চাই জয় থিউ চো উং জুং মো মো ডে থাইন তোয়ান ডিয়েন তু কে তু কি সু জুং উং জুং নাই তোই থাই ইয়েন তাম বা কো নিউ থাই জান জাইন জোই হন জুত নিউ vì mình có thể ngồi tại nhà và thực hiện thanh toán bất cứ lúc nào chỉ trong vài phút hơn thế nữa tôi cũng không lo bị quên thanh toán vì ứng dụng đã có thông báo nhắc nhở khi đến kỳ thanh toán Thanks, Mitali. Let 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 me start with some context of this webinar. So we all know financial inclusion is the building block to reduce poverty and improve options for greater greater equality and distribution of the reward of economic growth. Financial inclusion also brings a multiplier effect in boosting overall economic output, reducing poverty and income inequality at the national level. In the last two decades, globally we have made substantial progress. towards building a financially inclusive world today 69% of adults which is around 3.8 billion people have access to bank and mobile money accounts globally which is an 18% increase since 2011 despite the remarkable success around 1.7 billion people remain unbanked and much more underbanked further the gender gap in account ownership has remained at 9% since 2011 for many financial inclusion and financial health are two sides of the same coin however inclusion and health appears to be on different points of the spectrum the un sgsa recently defined financial health as a state where an individual can meet current needs absorb financial shocks and pursue financial goals initially conceptualized by metlife foundation through the gallup global financial health study in 2018 today policy makers and financial service providers worldwide are increasingly using the concept of financial health financial health is an improved approach than the more straightforward concept of financial inclusion it considers various factors such as psychological biases varying financial capabilities socio economic factors and social norms at play and we also saw in the video that we were talking about spend save borrow plan as uh, as four pillars of financial health msc has been working with various financial services provider across bangladesh and vietnam to improve the financial health of lmi segment in the past 3 years through our flagship program that is i3 funded by metlife foundation we have positive, positively impacted lives of around 9 million underserved clients in the bangladesh and vietnam market our intervention broadly covers improving the financial health of the lmi population by enabling access to formal financial services for new customers or through deepening uses and extending a wide range of financial services to the existing set of customers in this process MSC has supported different fintechs banks microfinance institutions mfs providers and government institutions in both markets to advance the concept of financial health this session will attempt to cover the financial health scenario of bangladesh and vietnam and how developing the financial health of citizens create a ripple effect by improving the overall economy the session will also answer the determinants of financial health and how our partners through the i3 program contributed towards building a financially inclusive and healthy economy so uh, let me let me quickly move to humaira apa 
whose foundation has been a pioneer in building a financially inclusive world. Appa, you know that uh, MFIs uh, play an essential role in building a financially inclusive world. A World Bank study of 2014, which looked at the long-term impact of microcredit program, concluded that uh, that they help rural households to enhance their income. And if we speak quantitatively, MFIs reduce poverty by 10% during the decade of 20, uh, 2000 to 2010. MFI help Bangladesh to decrease income inequality. Under the I3 program, as per, and as per your strategic priorities, the Shakti Foundation has taken various initiatives to reduce income inequality by ensuring easy access to microcredit. In your experience, how has easy access to microcredit improved the financial health of LMI women, more so in Bangladesh? Over to you, Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Anil. Uh, I will take this opportunity to uh, thank Microsafe Consulting for providing support uh, to Shokti Foundation for digital finance uh, project. This actually has been a milestone in uh, the development, in the advancement of technology for providing efficient and uh, hassle-free services to our women. Uh, to our women borrowers. So we are very really excited with the uh, uh, digital services that, uh, that's been provided to the, not only to the uh, support uh, to the borrowers of Shokti, but to microfinance uh, clients all over Bangladesh and elsewhere as well. Now, um, to answer your question, uh, I would say that the easy access to a microcredit or small loan has given women in the in, uh, low income household the opportunity to earn money by investing the loans in business and income generating activities. <clears throat> it has also helped uh, women to build assets. Now, with repeat loans, these women have increased their income and have scaled up their business or enterprises. Women have also diversified their investments for additional income and risk mitigation. Uh, in my 30 years experience in microfinance sector, uh, I have worked with two generations of um, Board, two, two generations of borrowers. I will give the example of one of the earliest borrowers of Shakti Foundation. Her name uh, was Ashtumi, and uh, was the first generation borrower, of course, and uh, her daughters, who are now the second generation entrepreneurs. Ashtumi was a destitute woman with two small girls. She used the income from the first and second loan to meet the basic survival need of her family, such as food, clothing, shelter, and or housing. Ostrumi had some experience in making leather shoes. So with the repeat loans and bigger loans, she started uh, household, uh, she started her own business in her house. At first, she sold her products at the, at the uh, community level but then consequently, she uh, began to scale up her uh, uh, business and she reached out to the middle uh, local markets and then to the middle markets. As her business expanded, Ostromi diversified her um, investments and started trading in leather. This brought additional income as well as mitigated risks. Ostrumi used her income to educate her two girls and improve the quality of her life. There was, there was quantitative transformation in the expenditure and consumption pattern of her household. Now, so Ostrumi really was the first group of entrepreneurs who stepped into uh, the commercial or the 
eco economic uh, sphere, and um, and and she used the microcredit loan to uh, understand business and to expand those business. Ostrovich's two daughters helped her with her business, and now they are second generation entrepreneurs. Ostrovich and other women like her are role models for their daughters and other women in the community. They will, these women, the first generation uh, entrepreneurs, uh, build the foundation on which the modern macro, uh, modern micro enterprise, build the foundation on which the modern micro uh, entrepreneurs are building their businesses and economic activities. Here, it is important to note that this generation of women, this is the second uh, generation of women entrepreneurs are young and also uh, they will be economically and commercially active um, for the ne next uh, at least uh, one and, or, or two decades, which is like they'll be economically active, active uh, for the next 15 to 20 years. Um, so, what I'm saying is that there has there's been this growth from the micro to the, if I talk about the uh, sector as a whole, the, the growth has been from micro borrowers to uh, entrepreneurial borrowers, and, and the market has also expanded. Now, the time has, and digital uh, financial services is a reality. And, but the important thing is that since these young generation is going to be the uh, entrepreneurs are going to be there for the next uh, 15, 20 or more years, the, the product has to be designed so that women may, may make maximum use of uh, these, uh, of the financial products and, uh, in, and expand their business and, um, not only do business uh, within the country, which is uh, an earn income, of course, but also they can go uh, to international markets. So having said that, I think um, it has um, brought financial, um, it has brought um, financial health, health to low income women. It has benefited them. And uh, and this is where I'd like to stop. And thanks, Apa. I think it was a very interesting story of not only one generation, but about two generations. And how credit has moved from, say, small or nano credit to something like micro or entrepreneurial credit. So I think <coughs> this has been a very interesting journey. Uh, for not only the borrowers, but for the society that how they are building their financial health over a period of time through better livelihoods, through better, better income generating activities. So thank you, Appa, for sh sharing that perspective and the story from Bangladesh. Let me turn to Atila from Vietnam. So Atila, with time as a function, both individuals and contextual factors shape financial health. Boosting financial health requires strengthening people's ability to generate maintain and replenish savings and other financial assets. Uh, robust technology acts as an anchor and driver to build an inclusive financial product. What are your thoughts on this? What role does technology play in improving financial health? How do you see the confluence of IT program and sustainable development goal, especially poverty alle alleviations? Over to you, Atila. Thank you for the question. Um, I think technology is uh, essential uh, to make a leap um, in, in the financial health of the people, just like people did uh, in countries like Vietnam, they never had landlines, they made the leap from no phones to smartphones. Uh, the same in, I think, in, in, in the finance area, many of the people will make the leap from no bank account to a digital bank account or the digital financial platform instead of uh, brick and mortar banking. Um, 
and Vietnam is especially well positioned for that because the mobile phone penetration in Vietnam is very high. Um, some statistics say that it's over two phone numbers of phone accounts per person in the country. Uh, one for calling and maybe one for uh, 3G use of service. So especially in the Vietnam context, it's, it's, it's very important to, to focus on, on the di digital aspects of financial health. Um, and, and especially in the COVID context, um, I give you an example. Um, one, one indicator of financial health is how many sources of income you have. And if you have a small little business, a small little shop, uh, you sell to your area of, of community in your community, then you have one source of income. Now, if you can move your, your business online, whether social media, which is very popular in Vietnam to sell things in social media, uh, and then you can have your underlying uh, applications uh, for transactions, for, for commerce, for even, even credit to finance your trades, then suddenly your small little shop or small little business has at least two main sources of income. One is your small little community and one is your social community. And, and we have seen this happening um, during COVID where uh, Saigon went through a five months uh, lockdown. Your traditional supermarkets was uh, kind of closed or not, not having enough supplies, for example, vegetables. So many people just called their relatives in, in the hometowns who send some vegetables and then they sell it here in, 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 in the big city directly, uh, skipping all the intermediaries, right? So suddenly, you know, you, you, you could have multiple incomes selling to a big community directly and, and have some payment online. So I think that that kind of dynamic is uh, very important to, to have uh, help people to move businesses online um, and, and diversify their incomes. Um, and of course, the second part is, is the credit part. Um, if you have uh, trading only in your community, maybe you buy things from your neighbor and you sell things to your to your your local purchaser of, of rice, right? For example, if you are uh, growing rice, then, then you don't need a mobile wallet. Uh, you pay everything in cash. But once you start to trade um, outside your community, then you need you need wallets. You need maybe some credit. So I think that that whole uh, whole process that is done by banks can be can be done by uh, digital finance companies, so to speak. Um, uh, again, one of the many ways people get financially ruined or get back to poverty is that they don't have a transaction history. Then, when something like COVID hits, they need to close down their business for a few months or anything that happens uh, they have to go to ask some money from family or some loan sharks and if you go to loan sharks then <laughs> then uh, poverty is a sure end so it's very important to, to have uh, build up a transaction history uh, whether you are paying your bills online like the lady in in the video uh, then you can uh, access to, to small credit uh, when when anything uh, like COVID hits or any any financial things happen. Um, and of course, the saving part in Vietnam uh, in the Vietnamese context, uh, people um, usually uh, save and buy a little bit of gold if they have extra income, uh, or if they even have a little bit more extra income, they buy a land now. The problem with gold is that it doesn't earn any income. The best case, it keeps value for rainy days, but you are not growing your wealth. And the problem with uh, land is that it's not liquid, especially in a pandemic we saw in, uh, in the case of pandemic. So it's very important to have some micro-saving solutions um, that generate some sort of income um, 
and, and, and people can move away from 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 gold and land as this main uh, value storage, uh, especially in, in rural Vietnam. So I think um, that's, that's uh, very, very important that can be sold uh, to digital solutions and digital programs to build up these saving systems. Um, and one very important thing, I think that is probably a next phase of development of all these technologies, especially of the rural part, is to offer all the, the, the people price transparency for the goods they produce. For example, uh, rice, coffee, uh, fruits are, are, are many of the products uh, produced in Vietnam. Now, if you harvest your coffee and you sell it right away when you harvest to your distributor in your town, your, your price is very low, right? And all the distributors end up taking all the margins. Now, if, if you have platforms to help you to give you price transparency and maybe some options in the nearest town, uh, you get a better margin or you, or you skip a, a few layers of distributors, you can get better margin, better saving. So I think uh, for, for many of the underserved in, in the banks, by the banks, uh, uh, I think it's, it would be very useful or very helpful for these programs to, to provide a lot of uh, price transparency, education, or even a commerce platform in these main goods for Vietnam, I would say coffee, rice, and, and some of these goods, where, where they can earn a little bit better margin, and that would improve their financial health. Uh, or even maybe they could get a credit against their produce, so they can hold it until... Uh, maybe a month later, the price goes up after the harvest, right? Um, so, so a lot of these these things, I I think um, a, a good digital platform that that enables payment, commerce, uh, savings uh, uh, could help quite a lot, um, especially the low and middle uh, income families, especially in the rural areas, to improve their financial health and improve their, their, their revenue and margins. Um, because especially a digital platform can bring all these things together. Uh, currently, banks do the, the transaction part and maybe the saving part, but not the trading or price transparency or, or business part. So, so digital platforms are good and very important because they can bring all this in the same place and if uh, millions of people living from uh, coffee pro uh, production or rice production then they could use this platform as a sub-segment for 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 these uh, these parts thank thanks atila i think uh, a very interesting thought uh, when you spoke about that how people are going to leapfrog from say no account to a digital account and i'm sure that uh, covid has really accelerated this journey and only thing is that we have to see over a period of time that uh, to what extent we are able to hold on to these gates because uh, our research and our work and a lot of practitioners they also agree that maybe we'll not have that many digital transitions as we see today but definitely they'll be much much more than what we what we have seen pre, during pre-COVID era. So, of course, there has been a lot of problem with the COVID, but probably this is the positive side of looking at it. That is my number one. And uh, second is uh, very interestingly, uh, like you expanded this scope, uh, not only from financial services, but taking it to the livelihood or the commerce side of it. Because digitalization, to, to a large extent, it will help if all of them, all of these things, they come together. So that, that I think, very interesting thought uh just just moving to the next round and uh, in this next round i'm trying to focus a bit on macroeconomic learning and what others can learn from that so quickly moving to apa first question to you uh, apa is that bangladesh government continues to progress on its financial inclusion goals by implementing policies designed to reach financially excluded bangladesh has achieved significant growth in terms of financial inclusion over the last decade between 2011 and 2018, Bangladesh overall financial inclusion by the numbers, it grew by around 56%. So 
the strong policy support by the government initiative from the private sector and interventions by the multilateral development partners have led to this progress based on your extensive understanding and learning what is the current state of bangladesh in terms of financial health as compared to what is happening globally that is first thing second is that what are the key initiatives that bangladesh has taken in the past to ensure financial health of their citizens so there are two questions uh, to, uh, okay thank you from the perspective of microfinance sector uh, from the perspective of microfinance the sector has graduated from microcredit programs that is very small loans small businesses to uh, and small savings to SME programs, meaning uh, medium and small enterprises. So there, this has resulted actually in a paradigm shift uh, from informal financial transactions to more formalized financial inclusions in terms of products, methods of financial transactions, and digital financial services. So. Uh, the microfinance sector of the early uh, two de three decades ago, two decades ago, is, is very different from the sector uh, that exists today. Um, and and it diff it's different in a very positive term because opportunities for investments, for diversification of investments, and uh, generating uh, generation of income, particularly women has um, has uh, has um, created opportunities for these women and it's really is um, very positive it has been very positive um, informal local markets again if we look at the market scenario informal local uh, markets have given uh, way to more formalized markets um, middle markets with uh, backward and forward linkages. This has resulted in higher household income and improved the quality of life uh, in general for the citizens of Bangladesh, but more importantly for uh, poor uh, household and uh, women in poor household. There is vice, this is uh, it's interesting uh, to note that there is wide scale government support in this sector. I think one of the driving forces behind this uh, shift in paradigm from the, from the uh, less to the bigger is, uh, is government support. It's, uh, the government of Bangladesh is developing, uh, an example would be the government of Bangladesh is developing a national financial inclusion strategy as part of the seventh five-year plan to leave no one behind through financial inclusion and digitization. And so this is has a macro uh, framework. The key focus of this um, government strategy is the deepening empowerment Initi uh, deepening empowerment uh, uh, initiative in agriculture, financing and refinancing of micro and small enterprises, increase access of the marginalized, po marginalized population through low or no cost banking products and digital delivery channels. Digital inclusion initiatives, technology infrastructure is being put in place to enhance first and last mile financial inclusion. So government is very proactive. They, uh, they are pushing uh, this sector uh, towards growth and uh, particularly and giving a lot of in, uh, emphasis in uh, digital services. Um, in order to promote financial inclusion among unbanked people, Bangladeshi banks have introduced several products with mobile banking and agent banking being the two most popular services, which we all know. The number of mobile banking agents, registered clients, and active accounts have increased significantly from 214 to 217, indicating um, growth 
and uh, active uh, participation, uh, particularly by low-income fam uh, families. Regarding your second question, government in the past encouraged the growth of microcredit sector and allowed NGO practitioners to experiment with, the, with microfinance programs and played this uh, government also played an enabling <clears throat> and non-interfering role. This actually has been very important, the growth of the uh, sector and, uh, and, to, uh, and in bringing the financial uh, health of the uh, population is that uh, there was a free uh, environment where people uh, experimented with different kinds of models. Uh, particularly, I would like to mention uh, pioneers like Professor Mohamed Yunus, Sir Fazle Abid, and others developed and experimented different uh, models one after another, leading to financially sustainable microfinance programs with huge client uh, outreach. So um, this is um, so this is the thing. The government of Bangladesh has been very supportive in the past and also now um, to uh, let the sector grow, micro, uh, microfinance sector as opposed to the macro sector grow, because uh, most of this of the population in our country uh, live in the micro, micro finance arena. So uh, rural areas, both in rural areas and urban areas. So government really is giving a lot of attention to bring these economically and commercially active, uh, active uh, citizens within the purview of, uh, of enterprise and uh, it, and income generation through investments and uh, investment. And one of the uh, key factors, which is the uh, government is pushing for quick uh, access to uh, quick access to income and employment generation is um, through digitaliz digitization. So, exciting times are ahead because we have the government support. Thank, 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 thank. I think uh, all are looking at Bangladesh in terms of the models which have come out and very, very nicely they have scaled. And I really like a couple of uh, like points just to reiterate for, for the benefit of uh, uh, all. <clears throat> that how do we, how have we graduated from very small loan to a uh, kind of a enterprise loan in, in Bangladesh. This is something which uh, I think other countries, they need to learn that because this, this is how they are going to support this income generating activities and better livelihood and better financial health. Second is, uh, I think government has been proactive in uh, most of the market and they, they have been very proactive even in Bangladesh market. Bangladesh market already has a national financial inclusion strategy. This is a recent document wherein they are talking about how to make sure that we are deeply financial inclusive and moving towards the financial health. And of course, very important uh, that you raised is that enabling and non-interfering role of the government. So this is this is extremely important that uh, they, 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 need to, they need to strike a balance that they enable these things at the same time, they don't stifle innovation and all that. So thank you very much for sharing that with that. So before I come to Atula, there is a question which has come from the uh, from the audience. And unfortunately, this question is meant for me. So probably I have had to take that. Uh, the question comes from Fifi. He says that, how does microsave measure the financial health and financial inclusion? Do you use standardized methods so we can compare the Vietnam and Bangladesh financial health? So I'll, I'll just maybe I'll take a minute to answer this. Uh, to me, actually, to us, uh, uh, like financial health and financial inclusion, we can always have the broad framework. Say, for example, for financial health, we have the broad framework of spend, save, borrow, and plan. But attributes of that and how it should be measured, I think this has to be based on the local context. 
one can on the basis of final outcome one can try to measure that across multiple market but uh, i i will leave that uh, for the time uh, for uh, for the future once we have those indicators and things available but definitely i would like to say, believe that we can have a standard framework but we cannot have the standard approach approach has to be rooted into the local context and what works or say what is relevant in bangladesh may not be relevant in, uh, in say vietnam so we have to be cautious on that things, right so uh, just uh, move, moving to uh, atila uh, just uh, here, is, here is my question so atila vietnam's economic development in the last 30 years was no mean feat and as reported by world bank between 2002 and 2018 gdp per capita has increased massively by 2.7 times and it has reached to a level of 2,790. Despite some hiccups of uh, COVID and all those things, I think we are still on track. The recently approved national financial inclusion strategy for Vietnam was another step in the right direction towards deeper financial inclusion. The strategy ensures access to essential financial products and services at affordable price for individuals and micro enterprises, such as payments, money transfer, saving, credit insurance, that you already spoke about. The strategy provides several solutions through a broad, through a broad convergence of actions to achieve the target involving multiple stakeholders in the financial sector. In your opinion, what are the factors that we must consider while measuring financial health? How does financial health help towards building a financially resilient economy? So, Atila, we would like to hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Indeed, Vietnam uh, as a country uh, in the past few years put a big emphasis on digitization, whether it's uh, the financial sector, whether it's uh, even the startup sector, whether it's uh, medical, health tech. So, as a country, Vietnam uh, put a uh, put, uh, a lot of emphasis on, on, on uh, digitization and then that also means bringing everybody on a inclusive digital platform whether we are talking about health insurance whether we are talking about financial services uh, one uh, and that's why i think uh, especially on the payment side and the money transfer side vietnam is quite ahead I think the focus in this uh, digital uh, so financial inclusiveness has to be on the saving, credit and insurance, side, especially to, to prepare or, or make the people more robust for sudden shocks and, and, and build up some savings. Now, one important factor to consider in, in the Vietnam context is the individual financial health and the family financial health. Because usually um, in Vietnam, uh, people have to support their families. If any of the family member gets into trouble uh, with the health or with the work or with the business, then the family can, can uh, must support and have to support. Um, so, so governments have to, or even policymakers or even players have to look not only the individual financial health and not only the individu individual context but the family context because a few bad events in the family can, can financially ruin the health of the whole family for example if if a cousin or if a brother or a sister has a, any 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 financial uh, unfortunate situation then the family have to come in and that may drain all the reserves all the savings all the the, the cash resources of the whole family so i think it's it's very important to not just look at individual statistics but look at at the family cluster level how is the financial health in the family then we can have a better picture how robust or how resilient is the individual and the family financially. I think that's one important aspect uh, when we look at financial health to, to assess where we are and how we can improve it. The, the second important thing I think is it's how do we look at financial health short term or long term? Because what uh, and I put here my healthcare uh, hat, and and we see that currently in Vietnam, 
people, as long as uh, the economy is, is moving ahead, people have quite a uh, suitable source of income or they have opportunities to have a good source of income uh, in the present. Now, that may come to the expense of their health. So they may even be saving money, they may even achieve their financial goals, but they are working in an unhealthy environment, they are eating unhealthy food, uh, maybe they, they are crammed in the factory in, 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 a, in a place far from home, so they start to develop mental health issues. So the financial health may look very good today they have a source of income they have jobs they are saving they may even you know have some uh bank account and and you, you would show up in the statistic as a as a as a progressing person but then maybe you were eating unhealthy and five years down the line you are diagnosed with cancer so or, or you have mental health issues and you lose your job um, and, 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 and we start to see this kind of negative effects of development that uh, the sudden increase, increase in income increases short-term financial health but ruins the long-term financial health due to health issues, health problems, um, and that also spill over to the entire family. So I think a lot of uh, education uh, needed from the government uh, not only on, on, on bringing everybody on board to have access to financial assets and start saving and, and, and get into to the system, but also to somehow look at the quality of those, look at the quality of those savings, look at the quality or what is the human cost of those savings that, that you are making. Um, so I think those those are the 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 factors to look beyond the statistics and be, be beyond the, the policy uh, that will come back to haunt on a long-term individuals, families, and, and even the, the community. And I think that's a big uh, developing country problem everywhere that, that um, uh, financial health is improving on a short term with, with a very long-term cost. Um, that ultimately becomes a zero-sum game for, for, for people. So, so building in sustainability in, in, in thinking about financial health, I, I think it's very, very important. Uh, and especially, I think, in this COVID time, that, that, that showed there is a must. For example, during the lockdown, many workers uh, who rented a five square meter room maybe or lived many workers in one place, they were locked down, they couldn't work. So their mental health, even after the opening, the first thing they do, they went home to their home, home country after being locked in a small room. So their mental health was not good, they drained our resources, they went home. Now the factories are open, but there's no worker to to, to produce and, and, and create GDP. So the financial health and the, the, uh, the real human health is important to consider even uh, for the workers, even by the employers, to make sure if you employ migrant workers, you provide them a, a proper accommodation maybe, you provide them healthy food, um, and, 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 and you help them to climb up on the development ladder. Um, I think that's, uh, that's the context. From, from the, the network side, accessibility side, I think at least on the money payment and the saving time, I think the private enterprises will handle it in the Vietnam context. But I think these aspects, and especially the saving credit insurance aspects, I think a lot of uh, uh, help is needed to make sure things are sustainable, things are balanced, and things are taking into account the human factor. Thank, thank, thanks, Atila. Actually, I really like uh, one, one major idea that you propose is that moving from individual to, uh, to the household. 
or to the family i think this is very important in the context or the country that we live in so where like economic unity is not individual but economic unity is the household of the family i think many governments also they have realized that when they design some of the say uh, direct benefit or social welfare scheme they keep the family at the center of it so i think that is that is very interesting point and and i think uh, the another point that you raise about the short term to medium term to long term type of financial health so i think fundamentally financial health is trying to look at if not law very long term at least at least in medium term because uh, inclusion may be at one point of time but health is slightly uh, longish in the sense whether we have enough to uh, survive for say next six months or whether we have uh, <clears throat> we earn or we have emergency saving that we, that we can use for uh, like whenever such type of uh, calamities of course it's a calamity is, is an exception but if there is a disruption in life how do we how do we do that so quickly moving to my last one uh, like the organizers have also reminded me that uh, we have about 10 minutes left so let me move to the last one and despite being a comparatively new concept Financial health has gained significant traction among, among policy makers. Financial service providers and policy makers use the determinants of financial health to design financial products and policies uh, respectively. Building digital financial products for the LMI population requires a nuanced approach that goes beyond accessibility. There is nothing like that one size fits all product as each community differs in digital literacy and access to enabling infrastructure. So uh, let, 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 me, let me have the first question for APA. So Bangladesh has pioneered many innovation in digital financial services, especially in mobile financial services. Despite the success, there is a considerable gender gap. There is 13% gender gap in phone ownership, 14% gender gap in MFS account ownership, and very high 29% in bank account ownership. Uh, our study titled gender, gender Centrality MFS Bangladesh it also suggests that the choice to use MFS is driven by a need or gap experienced by the users as they engage in financial transition. MFS provider hence must first identify financial needs and gaps among women clients and develop products and services to address this gap. This will expand MFS to the women. Shakti Foundation has been working towards democratizing MFS. In your experience, what are the nuances that must be considered while designing MFS products to ensure usability among them. So over to you, probably you have about three minutes to... Uh, yes, I will just quickly go to the point. Um, I think the, the issue here is uh, the problem is with the designing of the uh, product. I will just say it's a financial product. Uh, what, the, what has happened is the uh, there has not been any gender diversity. Uh, gender diversity has not been considered um, because the need of a woman is differs from the need of a man. So, uh, so services that have been provided, unless it is geared towards the need of the woman, uh, it will not reach her. So it is, uh, it is just that. And um, so uh, the thing here is, the, is one should quickly I, I ask the question. I mean, I, I, I ask the question to myself, is that if there was a woman, a low income woman, because her cultural and socioeconomic context is different, the value system is different, the situation is different. If she was, she, if she was to design a, a financial, a digital financial product, would she, what would, what would be her for her the most important things to consider? So I think what I would like to say here is that uh, designers must listen to the women as opposed to a generic uh, conceptual uh, conceptualization of uh, the gender. So I think um, men and women as a whole. So the designer has to listen to the women. And for this, I would quickly say, suggest three uh, things that can be done. First is to have a workshop uh, reg on regular basis with controlled uh, group of uh, women, uh, women users. Um, we, I would like here to again state uh, what the first practitioners of microfinance 
uh, microcredit program did was they experimented with the uh, models. And then once they were sure that these are this was a successful model, they went, uh, uh, others started replicating those. So I think that this is a very new concept uh, for uh, most people uh, to have cashless uh, transactions. And so, and so this, this is also a question of understanding. And uh, so I would suggest that there should be workshop with control groups of women and over a period of time, uh, different model ex uh, models should be experimented with. I'm sure that will give, in, uh, give some good result. Uh, and work on the feedback. The designer must work on the feedback um, from these women. Second thing is they should also have workshop with the field, field staff who are implementing these uh, programs. And that, that their feedback should also be taken into consideration when the program has been designed. Um, also, training is absolutely critical, uh, both for the uh, women and for the uh, field, field staff. Finally, um, I would also say that cost, cost sharing is an issue, and uh, women will pay, uh, would, would pay the prices, uh, the cost of services, if they think, if they see that it is really serving their purpose. Uh, thank, thanks, thanks Amar, for providing a very insightful uh, suggestions how to build for, for the women. Uh, quickly turning to Atila, so ever since COVID-19 stuck, government across the globe have battled the twin problem of immediate health emergency and the social and economic challenges that follow. One of the biggest challenges of COVID-19 is its huge treatment cost, which takes a toll on the finances and mental well-being of different sections of society. Timely and low cost insurance products can reduce vulnerability by providing financial cover during the occurrence of any unforeseen event. In your opinion, what kind of insurance product for health financing product should be designed to ensure that community's financial well being is taken care of? So, Atila, you have around two minutes. Yes, I, I try to be very short. Um, the Vietnamese government tries to provide uh, so called universal health care for everybody. Uh, now, still the problem if you are poor or, or, or low income is that when you use a public healthcare system, one, you still need to pay some, uh, some money to the doctor, to the nurse, to everybody in the system that is a cash payment up front. And secondly, if you get into the hospital, probably some of your family members have to come with you to take care of you and help you out with food and this, that. So I think one important insurance product in the Vietnam context, and I think for a low income uh, context, is to have insurance products which not only cover your, your medical fees, but give an upfront cash payment to, to handle all the non-medical related expenses to your benefit and also cover some of the expenses of your of your family members who take care of you, maybe have to leave their job, maybe have to take unpaid leave to come and take care of you in a hospital. So I think we need insurance product which look beyond the, the healthcare coverage, but provide some cash assistance for any hospitalization day at a very low cost. Of course, the very expensive insurance has these features, but in fact, the low cost insurance doesn't have these features. And the other, I think, very important um, in the Vietnam context, and it's also linked to savings, probably an insurance product that allows you to save for your children education and kind of like a unit link product and also act as an insurance if something happened to you as a parent or you need to draw down uh, for any education cost related things for your kids, that would be something very useful uh, many uh, people consider that their child's education is is the ticket out of poverty uh, for their children and they willing to do everything for their kids education so an insurance and saving product combined would would give a big incentive for for parents to save uh, day by day and it would also act an insurance when any 
thing related to education is needed. I give you again the COVID context, even the public education system went from offline to online. Now, many of the parents don't have laptops, uh, computers, uh, or anything like that. So some kind of uh, savings slash insurance funds, which you could use or utilize to throw down in such cases, or if, for example, many parents uh, passed away in COVID and the child is 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 um, having financial means for education. So some some product could uh, be very welcome by the market and would be very helpful for 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 the financial health of of uh, the future generations as well not only the current parents. So thank, thanks, Atiya. I think you raised a very important point here is around the digital divide that we are seeing across the market. And primarily, it is, uh, like, it's a question of have versus have nots. And uh, like it, it's now we are seeing even in vaccination, we are seeing in education, and which is, which is going beyond, say, financial services. So I think this is very important. So since we have run out of time, I would like to close this uh, webinar. And as I close, I would like to thank Apa and Atila for sharing their wonderful thoughts from different markets. I'm sure they will benefit viewers of those as well as other markets. I also want to thank such a wonderful audience for listening to us and sparing their, sparing, spare their, their time. I have a couple of questions. Probably time doesn't permit me to answer that, and we will try to answer them in an in offline manner. So thank you, thank you once again, and uh, have have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye bye.